Hey, my How's it going, How's it going mate? You alright? Yeah? How's it going, mate? You alright? Yeah. Kind of. You? Could be bad, but I'm okay. Yeah, I know it could be better. I've seen what happened when I woke up. Uh, I know, man. Hard time to deal with, but both hard times, so yeah. Uh, how is your leg uh, doing? Yeah, doing much better. Doing much better, thanks. Um, I think in a week I'm allowed off crutches, so that's that's good. Um, swelling's gone down massively. I mean, compared to what it was like at the beginning, it was freaking... <laughs> it looked like I had bloody a tumour in my leg because of all the swelling, but... Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's healed up very well so far. So, I mean, it's very promising um, because obviously my body uh, naturally adapts quite well to everything. I've had injuries before and uh, obviously my body's just, you know, it's used to cycling out and, you know, almost healing itself. So, yeah, we're going in the right direction. Obviously, it's going to be a long recovery, long way to go, but we're going in the right direction. Are you able to step on your leg, I mean, or, or you still can't uh, step on it? Uh, I, I can, but they're just not letting me at the minute just because um, they because they did something in there that basically they don't want me to put weight on because I'm allowed to bend it and like strain and all that kind of stuff, but they only let me put 50% at the minute, but next week they'll let me put all the weight on it. They just, they wanted the leg to heal properly. If I would have put weight on it straight away, they or even like they they usually give a guideline six weeks before you can put um, before you can put any weight on it. So uh, next week will be six weeks. So can you uh, imagine now? Let's uh, get back into the days uh, before the surgery and uh, after the surgery. Can you please uh, explain the whole post recovery process? How did it uh, look like? Yeah. So uh, well, the first. The first week was horrible. It's probably the worst pain I felt in my life. I thought when I had my right knee surgery, you know, about four years ago, I thought I thought that was bad, but this was like ten times worse. Um, the medicine wasn't helping. It did like the pain was like quite excruciating. But then after the first week, it already started calming down and that's when I started feeling a lot better and started getting more motivated. To be honest, the thing that was more annoying was those things up my nose. I had these, like, literally like that big, up, all, all the way up in my nose, like, stuck right up in there. And they told me I could only remove it after 48 hours. So for 48 hours, I was tearing up, like, you know, there's all these, these massive things just stuck up. And I, I literally, when I pulled it out, it, I felt like I had, like, pulling out an alien out of my body or something. It was like massive it was like that like literally like that big that was more annoying than anything because my leg was hurting it was like sore and then i had this crap up my nose so i was like <laughs> when am i gonna get break here but um yeah once i got the nose fingers out um then the leg already slowly was starting to heal up um and then yeah just day by day it was very swollen it was obviously uh, i couldn't really straighten it too great but now when I saw the doctor and I took out the stitches, slowly, slowly, the legs started getting better extension. And by next week, I should have full extension. And then, obviously, yeah, just work the rehab to get it back. It's still a little bit swollen. There's still a bit of scar tissue, but that's expected. So, after the match with Khalil Roundtree, was your nose broken or it was just very badly hurt? Um, well... See the thing is, I've I broke I broke my nose before, like quite a couple, I think about three times previously, and um, in the fight it fractured again, but it wasn't necessary. The bone was already fractured, like, but it was the cartilage that they said was fractured, so they just needed to clean it up and then move, like they moved a little bit back into the space. It's basically just the airway. The airwaves already were blocked before the fight, but it just made it worse in the fight. So they just cleared everything up. They said they couldn't move anything back because the bone had set in place from where it was broken previously. So they essentially just cleared my airwaves, which, uh, you know, was good. So, I mean, it, yeah, it, it broke. It probably moved a little bit more, but that was just because of the cartilage. All right, you have a mouthpiece in your mouth and uh, the airways are blocked so how do you breathe uh, during the fight it must be very challenging 
No, no, it's just normal. It, it's a fence question, just to know. That's a fence yeah, question. Yeah, no, of course. Um, I don't know. Like when when you, I've had this situation before where I had my nose broken in sparring, and then your blood, the the blood just gushes from your nose, and you sort of just, I don't know, it almost for for a little bit like makes you breathe a bit better. <laughs> it almost sounds counterproductive, but it sort of opens up your airway like a little bit for like maybe about 10, 15 seconds, and then obviously everything starts closing in again. So yeah, I mean realistically, you you have to start breathing from your mouth, which you know isn't a good thing obviously we're taught to try and breathe through our noses but it's all i could do i mean listen my cardio was good enough especially in the fight that i didn't have to worry so much about breathing through my nose although it would have helped my cardio was good enough to push myself like through that it was mainly just because obviously the blood started rushing and then uh I, you don't really feel those things in a fight you don't feel when your nose is broken like even if my nose would have been here I doubt I would have felt anything. Do you know what I mean? Because you're, you're not worried about that. So, uh, yeah. But I've, breathing was fine. Like I said, because my cardio was good before the fight, that's why it was okay in the fight. Okay, this is another fans question. I've noticed that Modesto's moment was outstanding against Mikalidis. In the last three fights, I've noticed there were some... Uh, some uh, different moments was it because of his uh, previous knee injuries did he have a knee injury before uh, or after the fight with jimmy crude i've had a um i've had a knee injury stemming back from before my cage warriors title defense which got worse over time but i wouldn't say that it affected me because the only time it really affected me was I would say 10 weeks before well i don't know i think it's affected me the whole time because i used to be able to do backflips and ever since that 2019 fight i couldn't do backflips because the the stability wasn't there so i mean yeah my 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 leg got so strong that held everything in place but uh essentially obviously i couldn't do certain movements because the stability wouldn't quite be there and it just took time and time for it to get stronger and stronger so I mean, in the Michalidis fight, I mean, I had bursitis in my knee and my, obviously my movement was, was still good. But again, that's the particular fighter. If you stick and move with Michalidis, you're most likely going to beat him because he's a bit more flat-footed with his style. Um, the movement with, like, for example, with Jimmy Crute didn't work so well because he was an aggressive forward fighter trying to kick my legs and then trying to counter so that particular situation meant that any movement i was so yeah i stopped the takedown but any movement i was making he was just trying to come creep forward get the leg shots off and then try and land that punch off of my counters off of my shots so again in that particular fight movement didn't necessarily work too well because um because again because of that style in the Oleg Shechuk fight, again, another forward pressure fighter. So he was cutting off, again, in a smaller cage as well, he was cutting off the cage. So movement worked to get me out of trouble, but not to, I mean, even then in that fight, I still landed quite a lot of dangerous shots. And then in the, in the Khalil fight, um, he, again, he, he was countering me off of my shots. So his game plan was perfect. If you noticed, my first shot I threw, I threw a shot and then he threw a shot right back and I slipped out of the way with, with my feet. And then as soon as I threw the front kick, he was, he essentially was, he was waiting for that to land his shot. That's when he caught the first big shot on me. And then afterwards, but the, in that fight, the good thing that I had was that I wasn't going backwards. I was a bit more, yeah, I, I was moving around, but I wasn't bag pedaling the whole time. Like I was in Oleg Shechuk fight. Um, but again, another thing that Khalil done well was counters. So every time I would hit, he'd always have trying to get something back. That's why in the second round, it started going a little bit of a different direction because when he then, when I would then land shots and he would throw back, I would always slip out of the way. Whereas in the first round, he had caught me off a, after, after a couple of shots. So it took me another round to sort of get into it. So, but if you're talking, again, we're talking about movement, 10 weeks before the Khalil fight, I injured my knee pretty badly. So the kick that he threw just essentially 
but you know made it made it much worse so um but even then saying that the injury that i had wasn't as bad as everyone thought it was so you know although it looked gruesome it wasn't as bad as everyone thought it was so um i will definitely agree though that my movement will be much better when i return because i'm not going to have that problem in my head shit like my knee i couldn't throw psychics in the Khalil fight i couldn't throw i'm talking front leg psychics i couldn't my spinning attacks were were a bit less i had a bit more hesitation so you know with those things in mind yes you could say that my my movement was affected but i think my movement was mainly affected for the khalil fight as opposed to the previous fights the previous fights they just were doing things tactically to 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 work around my movement so i actually had to try and move differently to stop their game so it's quite complicated when when you look at it but you know this is just something as a martial artist you just got to figure out and and move on you know Right, well, my fans are saying that in Mikhail Alexichuk's fights, uh, you won uh, two rounds, while third round went into the favor of Alexichuk, according to majority of my fans. What do you say about it? Um, that's what most would say. Um, I looked at the judges. I don't know how the hell two of the judges gave him the first round. Makes no sense. Um, because that was the best round for me. Even the second round, it's like... There wasn't really much going on and then obviously i landed i rocked him in the second i rocked him in the first and then he caught me one body shot in the third but even then everyone says that i lost the third round and yeah i guess you could say probably that was the biggest strike differential but he landed one good shot on me and i was still firing back i still landed shots on him so you know it, it was it was you know it, it was annoying but look if you're looking at it from the case of who's landed more shots, yeah, I should have won that fight. But if you look at it from who's got more forward pressure and um, control in the cage, obviously you give it to him. But yeah, I thought it was fucking so stupid. Where the hell in their minds with these judges for the first round? To, if anything, I would have said, oh, oh, if the judges would have thought the second round maybe went to him, I would have been like, but even, but like I said, it makes no sense when you rock someone, when you damage someone, and that they end up winning the round. You know, spinning back kick at the end of the round, roundhouse kick at the end of the round. I mean, <laughs> and even in, like I said in the middle, caught like a barrage of shots, stopped every single one of his takedowns. So yeah, that was a very disappointing loss. And had it gone the other way, you know, perhaps I would have still been in the UFC today. But I think this is all a blessing in disguise. Perhaps it was supposed to teach me something, and I've already, I've already, you know, looked to to figure out what those things were. You are the first ever Lithuanian fighter who stepped inside the ring. So, how are you feeling about it? That name will be remembered forever. Uh, do you know what? It felt good, but now it doesn't feel so good because the, the story's not over. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, what's most disappointing is when you go into these fights knowing your capabilities and you just can't perform. Like, and I've said it a million times and people will probably start not to believe me anymore. To be fair, I couldn't give a shit. But obviously, for me, it's, it's the most disappointing as an athlete. That I wasn't able, that I haven't been able to fully show what I'm able, what I'm able to do. Now, obviously, I'll, I'll be able to, like, I'll be able to work to do that, fighting in another promotion to get myself back in there. I wasn't ready to perform the way I should in the UFC at the time, which is why I feel like at the minute it doesn't feel so great because I don't want to be down in history books. Oh, the Lithuanian first Lithuanian in the UFC, but then it gets cut and then does nothing. No, I want to be remembered as a UFC champion and the first Lithuanian champion. Someone who got cut, comes back, and proves everyone all wrong. Everyone thinking that he's not going to come back, the injury's too bad, this, that. I want to be remembered for the guy that came back from all this adversity and showed everyone what he's all about. Right now, the story ha the story's not over. And I, I know for a lot of people, you know, they think this, the, the script is over, but for me, it's not. So, although it was an amazing feeling to be the first Lithuanian to 
obviously, um, and I do have a lot of Lithuanian support, so I've got to send all my love to all the people that have been messaging me and, you know, sending me well wishes. I'm, like, you know, I have got a hell of a lot of support, obviously, because, you know, I essentially put the country on the map to be in, in the bigger leagues. But I'm not done yet. I'm not satisfied. Like, okay, I was satisfied with getting to the UFC, but I won't be satisfied until I got that belt around, around my waist. So that's that's that. Another, uh, another uh, like, let's say, we can't call it a question, it's an assumption from my fan, but uh, Mikhailidis fight, nobody has ever the, scored uh, such an elbow KO in the history of UFC. Like, there were problems when people were mixing Travis Brown elbow with your elbow, and even here I was having massive problems to explain that to people. Like, with foreign fans, it's okay. Foreign fans are pretty much, you know, they understand. But here, the problem in Serbia, for example, majority of coaches uh, know everything. And when they say they were claiming it was Travis Brown elbow, but uh, it's it's obviously isn't because it's a modification. It's a very much of a legal elbow. So you also have another thing uh, that will um, put you on the map, and that's that elbow knockout. Like, I like to call it Modestus elbow here because <laughs> nobody has ever scored it uh, like that. So uh, how do you feel about that? Oh, and I, I really appreciate that, mate. Thank you for obviously uh, showing your love and support. I love that. The the Modesto elbows. <laughs> Hopefully I can put a stamp on that later on as well. But yeah, so, you know, you've been practicing it. You put, you know, you, you figure out placements. You've got to figure out how a way to get that get the opponent out of the way. I had a lot of backlash because obviously, you know, there was a lot of hype, not only around me, but around Mihalidis as well. So, obviously for him to lose with those particular elbows, like there's people that have done that move later on and everyone's okay with that. But when I did it, everyone had a massive problem with it, which is, which is crazy. But like I said, ever since I did do it, more people have been doing it. So, you know, as they see it's an opening, yeah, you want to, you want to fucking wrestle? We'll show you how to bloody wrestle. Do you know what I mean? Get, get, get them out of there in a different way. And, and, and I think it was mad because the, the marks were clearly in the right spot. I just spoke to the referee. The red mark, exactly, was in the correct spot. It was all oh, back of the head, back of the head, this, that. Oh, it's 12 to 6. There is no way in hell, yeah? How can you hit from the side, the side of the head? It's not going straight down. Otherwise, there'll be marks up here. Do you yeah, know what I mean? It would be like this. Yeah, exactly. I would have come straight down. No, I took... You twist right in. It's like a banana. If you imagine a banana, it goes from here to there. So... The shot end up probably going from like uh, I don't even know what the clock would be from like ten to four or something. Do you know what I mean? So it's like it is a, in an angled shot. So yeah, I think it was good that now I had that weapon in my arsenal, and I'm like, okay, well I'm going to use it. And I don't think many people have landed quite as much power in that particular pos position, which is why I'm happy that. I guess I've got my own, you know, my dad has been working that shot with me and it's given me, like I say, that own uh, individuality to that particular move because I don't think many people have landed quite such power in those in that particular position, like being held up against the cage and then still landing enough power to throw those elbows. So, mate, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that, you know, uh, like I say, we can... Uh, we can make we can make that move a little bit like I say more more individual for myself um, and yeah if anyone wants to you know anyone wants to wrestle in the future obviously those, those are going to be there and I'm glad to see it more more in MMA now because you know it means that your wrestling has to be even tighter so you know because that's obviously a very dangerous move so uh, yeah man we're bringing power back to the strikers. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, UFC is evolving. The sport is developing. The sport is growing every single day. For example, here, like uh, uh, 15 people from here told me that that's the same move because people don't follow. They don't care. Well, I've got to give a shout out to one Serbian coach. His name is Ivan Georgievich Vitsko. Got to give him a shout out when we were talking. And he's an example of a coach. I mean, he's a very good coach. I think he's the best Serbian coach ever. But you know what's his philosophy when he comes home? He is watching security cameras, you know, and he's constantly saying, I know nothing, I know nothing. And I'm like, okay, okay, man. But he knew the difference when I mentioned it. He knew the difference. And, 
And uh, he told me, yeah, I do know. He explained how it works, CTC. I was watching the fight against Michaelidis, but like 15 people here, they were like, what are you talking about? This is not a move, this. So yeah, people, people are afraid of changing, advancing, progressing. So it seems you started progressing earlier, like mm -hmm. uh, you adjusted very early on. What do you think about that? Yeah, exactly. The, like you, you said it exactly right. Uh, the game's evolving, man. You've got to find way. I mean, how? What's the best way to close out the end of that round? What, you know, have a guy, you know, trying to attempt to take down and doing nothing with it, and then you're going into the second round. When I also had a, you know, my knee was swollen, so it's like, do I really want to be moving on that knee a lot? So I had to try and do. And you know, when your dad shouts elbows, 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 of course you're just gonna, you're just gonna get on with it. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it takes as well, you've got to be good with your targeting, like your uh, precision. I think as well, you know, that shot could end up not very good. Like it could end up the wrong way. You know, you could end up hitting the back of the head and stuff like that. But that's where it takes even still that concentration to try and get it in, in, in the better spot. So, but again, that, that comes from that comes from practice. That comes from, like I say, the game changing seeing shots that are available to you it's, it's 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 exciting man because like i say it gives you um it 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 just shows that you know where people used to get out wrestled before in those positions like you're seeing it so much now people can't just keep their heads dipped down in that position anymore so it's great i think it's it's a it's a massive um you know like you say credit to um to mma being even more of a chess match now you have to think even more when you're wrestling and it and it, it takes away a little bit of the power from the wrestlers and gives it more to the strikers now obviously if you've got a very good wrestler he'll be able to do certain things but in practice if you're just holding onto a leg you know or or in a fight sorry you're not going to go that far you know so yeah man it's uh and then there's loads of other moves that are, that are being invented and, and, and made up all the time. But that's why, you know, next generations of fighters are going to be that much more deadly than the last generation. It's, it's just how it goes. Every generation keeps building up. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So right now, I know you're recovering still. How is the one day right now looking in your life? Well, um, I'm trying to do a lot more things, like especially social media wise i've upset myself goal like because i was always thinking about doing my youtube channel you've given me a lot of inspiration as well with your youtube channels you know what i mean like uh you know you've got you've got um you know thousands of sub subscribers now you started off very small and you built your you built your way up you've been very consistent so this is absolutely amazing like it's amazing to see there you go my man <laughs> he's bought out the cowboy hat yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah so you know and like I say, you've got your niche, you've got something that you can sell and you put it out there and you didn't care what anyone else would think. You do you because it's you who you are and you're showing people. And look, like I said, now you're gathering a following and you just thought, you know what? I want to start my YouTube channel. I'm going to get on it. I'm going to do it. So that's given me a lot of inspiration because obviously now I can't do anything. I've been training, but obviously just from sitting and my dad has just been working different stuff to help me improve my upper body strength and, and blah, 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 whilst doing physio. But then on the, on the flip side, I've been doing my posts on Instagram. I've just started a TikTok. Um, you know, I'm trying to do things that in this day and age, you need to be, you need to be in tune with if you're not you're like i've been watching some guys like i've been getting inspiration from other places because you know mma as well as a brand you've got to market yourself if you can't market yourself you ain't going nowhere like it's mad that guys who who've got the same you know U, ufc fights as me have less followers and then there's some guys with the same ufc who have more followers and it, it just depends on how you market yourself so YouTube is actually a great way of being able to do that, to show people what you're all about. So that's one other thing. It's made me more creative. Like you have to think, oh, what can I do for a video? What can I do for a post? What can I do for this? So I've been thinking a lot on that. I've also been trying to learn my Lithuanian because, mate, that is one thing if I have on my bucket list of things that I need to do is to learn it. And I've been getting better, like in terms of understanding it now and reading it much better. Speaking it is very hard still because my accent and it sounds horrible sometimes and I get a bit embarrassed. But um, at the same time, that's also getting better. So I've been working on that. So side with training, working on my social media, working on my media platforms, um, doing... Um, 
obviously the Lithuanian and not only that um, I've started like I've, I've visualized techniques so you know visualization helps for when you come back to doing things physically you're a bit better mentally to to understand the technique so I've been doing that and then writing a journal because listen I tell you what when I make the biggest comeback in history they, there's going to be a book written about that kind of stuff and I, I just want to document that every single day so I've been staying busy whilst I like I thought there's two choices. I can either sit here and watch Netflix all day <laughs> or and, and do my physio and my training or whatever, or I can actually make use of my time. I need to make use of my time. Like these days are just going by and there's, you know, there's nothing going on. Like today, I'm not going to lie, is a little bit less productive just because of obviously the events that have just occurred. But, you know, now my motivation is coming back again already. Tomorrow I'll be back on the horse. So, you know, you you've got to make use of your time. If you're if you're sitting around not doing anything, you're you're not doing anything good. Like I've gotten more following and stuff like that, and more attention just from the videos that I've been putting out. And it's good to to document those things. So yeah, man, I've been trying to stay as busy as possible. Well, yeah, when you already mentioned popularity, I got to share you one thing from this summer because uh, if you get too famous, that's also that can also ricochet over your head. For example, I was having. Usually I went to Bulgaria now when I go like every summer. I have one big fan. Her name is Anelia though. Um, my fan number one. I made her merch like you don't know even how much. And uh, <laughs> one day she came and uh, the agreement was I am inking and she brought 20 people. I was like, why are you doing this? And she said, now it's time to be famous. She was, I was thinking she is throwing, but right now when I go there, when I want to go running, I always, uh, I, I never uh, take the shortcut because people are always humping me. So uh, when you go to Lithuania, maybe that's going to happen to you. No, I'm serious, man. <laughs> well, like I say, I'm, I, I just need to make sure that I can speak it good enough to where uh, I can actually be able to communicate with people. I mean, most people nowadays, they can they can speak English, okay, or understand it, okay. Like, I've had a lot of Lithuanian people message me, uh, and we, we talk a mix of between Lithuanian and English, and then most of them are actually quite surprised. They're like, bloody hell, he actually speaks okay. But, you know, um, but yeah, man, it's funny because I do want to go back to my, to my home country at some point. Um, but yeah, obviously, my mind's focused now on, you know, recovering, getting back to fighting, and then, and then, you know, maybe those holidays will come back, you know, later on down the line. Also, whilst my language gets better as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I also grew up in the foreign land, so I know how it is. But uh, I was just, uh, I was learning in the beginning via internet, but then I met an alien, she learned me to speak. So it's not perfect <laughs> still, but it's not perfect still, but I understand everything they say. Like, uh, whatever you say, I'll understand, but I'm having a hard time responding. So, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I feel, I feel you, man. Yeah, probably. I feel like, you, man. Uh, is Lithuanian hard as a language? No, really, no. Is it hard? It's, um, I think it's one of the harder languages because it's a mix between Latin and something else. I'm not sure what influence it has, but because it's got elements of Latin, Latin in it, it makes it more difficult. Like, it, what makes it so hard is that it doesn't translate equally from English to Lithuanian. You can't say... I am going to the shop. Like you'll say, it is to the shop that I'm going. Do you know what I mean? It's like a different, things are said in a different way. There's also accents in there and um, the expressions are different. So that's what makes it so hard. And when people, pr to pronounce it especially, when you've got an English accent, man, fucking hell, it's so hard to do accents from any other, any other region because like obviously I've, I've got quite a, I don't know, maybe like a Cockney sort of accent, but it's because you, you, you mispronounce or you don't pronounce every letter. Whereas in Lithuania, you have to pronounce every letter. Otherwise, what, again, one word can mean different things depending on how you pronounce it with the accent. So, and then obviously the verbs and the way, if you talk about us and we and this, mate, it's, uh, it's complicated so I'll, I'll definitely put it up there as being one of the more complicated languages to learn. Um, I guess in all fairness, it's probably one of the more useless languages to learn because obviously the only place that you can speak Lithuanian is in Lithuania. But I guess that, that, that goes for the same for any other country that, you know, speaks only realistically one language. So um, I think it's good that 
obviously I've gotten very good with English because that's a very multi transitional language like all over the world. But there's just something about being able to speak your hometown language that makes a big I don't know, something in the heart gives you like a big motivation, you know what I mean? I think it must be the same for you with, you know, like, but obviously, you know, you grew, you grew up in Bulgaria, right? No, I grew up in Serbia. I was just born in Bulgaria. S- I was Serbia, born in a okay. small place near Kustendil, but my parents immediately moved. Literally, I was born uh, one month earlier than normal. And I should have uh, been born in Serbia. And then, but I was going every year, you know. And uh, I was having a hard time learning because I'll tell you something in Western Bulgaria, for example, in Eastern Bulgaria, Eastern Bulgaria speaks more like Russians. Western Bulgaria speaks more like with Serbian accent. And some words don't mean the same. For example, for I love you, you have two words. You can say harassmente and obichante. Don't mean the same. Absolutely don't mean the same. Harassmente <laughs> is for dog. Literally. <laughs> no, literally. Uh, I can definitely trans. I I, I can definitely uh, relate to to what you're saying because that it has similar elements, obviously in Lithuania. But I think because those all those countries in that Eastern European region, they they have similar influences. You know what I mean? Like even, but it's weird because Polish is completely a different language to Lithuanian, and they're right next to each other. Latvian, I think, is the closest to Lithuanian. Like Latvian, you can. It's almost like I can imagine any Latvian speakers go to Lithuania and they'll be able to pick up the language quite quickly because I've, I've I've got a couple of Latvian friends and they will, they'll pronounce certain words and I'm like they sound very similar. So, but from all the other languages, it's it's it's, it's different. But yeah, man, it's uh, it's cool being having that Eastern European influence. I think is uh, is amazing because, uh, like I say, the languages are so intricate and 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 beautiful and. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a lot more beautiful than English, that's for sure. So uh, I'm definitely going to... Uh, every day I've been working on it. So hopefully, with it, I reckon within six months, I could probably get quite fluent with it if I just do it every single day. Because obviously, I, I can't spend the whole day speaking in it. But like I, I do like an hour or two a day and do that over time. It should, you know, it should be all right. To, I try talking with my dad, but he always laughs at me. Because obviously my accent sounds horrible, so obviously when you know, but he does try and help me. He he, he helps me out a lot. Anytime I ask him for anything, he always he always helps me to pronounce things better and stuff like that. Yeah, and also between Serbia and Bulgaria, we have some words that are written the same, said the same, but have different meaning. For example, in Serbian, something that means I'm gonna kill you in Bulgarian means I'm gonna pet you. No, literally. <laughs> And Crazy. people are saying, oh, yeah, similar, but uh, in Serbian you have uh, Latin and Cyrillic. In Bulgarian it's only Cyrillic, like Russian letters, and letters are not the same. So it's like, yeah. it's it's not easy, especially when these uh, languages in Lithuania have seen, man, so many different symbols. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 man, it's crazy, it's crazy. But like I said, we, we've got to love it, man. That heritage gives us something unique and different. And like I say, especially with you, uh, you know, Serbian and Bulgarian, and then obviously the English as well, man. It's, that's amazing, do you know what I mean? You, being multicultural, that's the, that's the best way to be, you know what I mean? Yeah, I also know to speak German and Spanish a bit, but German I speak pretty much fluently and I can even copycat accent, but it's not as good as English, but I can copycat accent you. pretty much he's, well. He's a, he's a, he's a multi, multi-linguist. I need to, mate, I need to get on your level. It seems like it, it takes me ages to learn languages and look at you already knows four different languages. Yeah. I feel like I'm slacking, man. I need to, I need to get better at it. <laughs> well, yeah, this combination today as well as you see, you can recognize your flag. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but this is normal, you know, that's the only difference. You see, that's the yeah. only difference. Like when people were asking... Oh, yeah, because cause Oz, Oz, Oz is, Oz is um, yellow, yellow, green, red. Oz is yellow, green, red. Yeah, Ari so, yeah, is uh, the, the only one. white, green, red is Bulgarian. White, green, red. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, was, I was just, just going to say, yeah, it's only one color that's different, yeah, yeah only one color that makes a difference i know that right now you don't have uh, plans at the moment but of course you plan to keep the ball rolling and to keep uh, training so what would be the next level at your training considering that your knee injury is still you know creating issues um in terms of mma i'm probably leaning on the boxing side first 
So I'll probably be able to train boxing at the earliest. And then shortly after that, I'll probably be able to drill jiu-jitsu. Shortly after that, I'll probably be able to... Wrestling is going to be the last thing I'll be able to do because of the pressure on the knee. So obviously that will be at the end of my recovery. But I mean, for the earlier stages, I can box a lot and then I'll be able to start adding the kicks in. So then I can kickbox and then I can start adding the jiu-jitsu, just drilling, sparring and full training will only happen at the end of recovery. But, you know, it will go bit by bit, man. Like I said, as recovery gets better, as I'm able to do more things. I mean, look, I saw uh, Tatiana Suarez. Um, she's in the UFC. She's 9-0. and She's coming back from four ligaments that are torn and she's already jumping onto a box after 10 weeks. So that's very promising considering mine was nowhere near as bad as that. So, you know, if she's jumping on a box after 10 weeks, who knows what I'll do after 10 weeks, you know what I mean? So, like I said, it just depends how the body recovers, but the body will only recover as well as the mind recovers. So, as long as I keep strong in the mind, the body will follow. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. But when, when somebody is not healthy, that's the worst thing that can happen to him. So, yeah, if yeah. he can box after 10 weeks, that would be awesome. How's your daddy feeling about the whole process? It's, it's upsetting for him, obviously. You no know, one wants to see your son go through, you know, these tough and challenging times. But at the same time, he's still optimistic because he know, you know, he just gets angry because he knows what I can do. But why the hell am I not? It's what I've been saying to you. I get frustrated with myself. I'm like. But, you know, I bet you there's athletes like that who, you know, are so talented or, you know, they might have so many skills, but then they just can't, you know, can't perform. Like, I found ways to perform at, at, you know, at the level where I was. And then when I move up a level, I always have a struggle to transition. And then, so that's where now I'm, I've learned my lessons and now I feel I'm going to be able to bring those things out again. So he's he's very optimistic because he knows what I can do. All my training partners know what I can do. I just need to go out and do it. And so he's very excited at the prospect of training to get better and even adds a bit of old school in there. So, you know, to, to make me that much better. So he he knows I'll come back. He He's upset, but he's always upset when he sees me upset. But he's always figuring out a plan as to how to get back, which is why I love him, and which is why we do so well, because, you know, you've got to have very close people with you to get through these the only people that have been in my dark times have been my family so you know where a lot of people would have turned their back on me they've never done that so you know my dad uh i want to make a good life for him so i know i know it will happen i know all these years of hard work are gonna are gonna pay off unfortunately it's not now but this is the thing he's very motivated to train me he's very motivated that I'll be able to come back much better. And that then translates to the way that we talk, the way that we plan everything going forward. So realistically, it's hard seeing it when it happens and hard seeing how I react and things like that. But in terms of moving forward, we're in a very good place. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I can't wait to see your return, man. Never mind which promotion is, but it's going to be a great return for sure. Yeah, thank you, my man. And like I, I, I gotta say that I really appreciate your support always throughout all my fights and your belief in me, because I want to be able to, you know, prove my support right. Because I feel like I've done you a bit of a disservice because obviously I've not been, like I say, I've not been performing the way I should, the way that you know I can and the way I know I can. I've not been doing it, and you're probably thinking this thing come on, Modesto, get a grip, like, get your shit together, like, you know, do what you can do. But I'll figure it out. So next time we go out there, my friend, any prediction you make that goes on my side, I'm going to back you up this time. I got you. Yeah, absolutely. And for Khalil, the only reason I picked no distance is because of the fact I had doubts for you about your knees. Because of your movement against Alexichuk, that was mm-hmm. the problem. I've seen uh, I've seen you were having some issues in round three, and I was thinking, I know how you move, and I knew it wasn't cardio issue because I know your cardio is top notch. I would give a ten out of ten on cardio. So 
I know it was not cardio issue. That that was the only thing that scared me in the fight against uh, Khalil. You know, I was doubting about your knees, so it was. Yeah, and then then yeah, obviously it ended up it ended up being that way. But uh, and as a fighter, you always what I've learned as well. You know, sometimes being a company ma company man is good, but at the same time, you gotta look out for yourself, man. You got to do what's better for you, not what's better for the company. Do what's good for you, because I've look, I've done what what I thought was right for the company, and unfortunately, I've been released. Now I can't blame them for that because I've not performed because they put their. But it just shows how much the belief that they did have in me. We're gonna have to get it back, but that's okay. I know that's it. That's my path now. Is to get back to the UFC. Everyone's been talking about oh PFL, Bellator, this that. Forget all that. UFC, that is it. So um, when I'm ready, I'll come back. I'll fight. I'll get a couple of wins. And then I'll get back in the UFC. My time to be a superstar was not now. But I know in the future it will happen. So that's it, man. That That's, li that's literally the mindset I've been going with um, throughout this whole time. So... Uh, First, I just got to focus on recovery, and that's it. Yeah, thank you so much for this interview. We'll put the situation right now, and uh, hope like maybe two or three hours. You need if it's a bit longer, it takes more time to create. But uh, I will let you yeah. send you a link. Cool. Um, just yeah, just send me a link or you know tag me in or whatever, and obviously I'll post it up there, and uh, we'll get it out there, my man. Yeah. Thank you, Modestus, and I hope we're gonna see a quick recovery. I know you're you're uh, dealing a hard injury right now, but Next year, we will see a massive recovery. A hundred percent, my man. Thank you so much, mate. Much love to you. Um, hope you're doing well. Much love to you and your family. And yeah, I'll, I'll catch you real soon. Um, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hope my MRI results are going to be in like two or three weeks. It's like, but I hope it's not, if it's not in serious, it's awesome. Yeah, please let me know how that all goes. Yeah, please, please message me whenever you get the results. Yeah, I will. The doctor believes it's uh, it's something. I don't don't want to tell you right now what exactly it is, but yeah, get a th get a therapy and live normally. But until we get results, that's it. Yeah, obviously you don't know. Yeah, all right, man. Well, like I say, best of luck with all of that. And yeah, like I say, we we'll we keep tabs on each other, man. Have a great day and thank you. My so man, much. you too. Yeah, take care, my brother. Bye bye.